Peter, and it will give uh, this vision of a full stack. Good. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the opportunity to to communicate a little bit with the with the, with the uh, community that that uh, I've, with whom I've hardly been in contact so far, which are software engineers and people that really focus on software development. Uh, I'm a computer engineer, and I did almost 20 years in, in University of Technology in Delft. Uh, and I worked for, I think, six, seven years on quantum computing. Uh, and, uh, and I'm now in a phase where, where I say, okay, I've, I've, I've realized everything that I could look at. Yeah? And of course, there's, uh, there's a lot that needs to be done by the physics people. So if I, have, if I make certain comments, it's never to insult anybody, but it's simply to make clear what is where we are and, and where, where we should uh, go for. Yeah? So um, um, I'm indeed, as, as Rui said, uh, I'm now uh, quite recently appointed uh, uh, as a professor in, at the University of Porto. But my main goal uh, in the first phase, at least, is to start QB. And QB is, uh, is a company uh, uh, and whose name is inspired by Bluebee and Bluebee.com, maybe you know it or maybe you don't, was recently bought by Illumina, which is a, a US-based uh, uh, DNA uh, manufacturer. Uh, so DNA is a genetic profile that we all have, that we share basically with, with, with all kinds of animals, uh, we, because we all come from the same kind of background or, or predecessors. Um, but QB uh, has as its main goal to, to develop quantum accelerators. And, and I will give one, one short example of one on which we currently are working, and I want to keep on doing that in the, in, in the once uh, once I start uh, living in, and working in, in Porto, uh, because now I'm doing a sabbatical at the University of Leuven in Belgium. I'm I'm originally Belgian, yeah, so uh, that's why uh, I'm I'm now in Belgium, but I will move to Porto in in two or three months from now. Okay, so my, my talk is about this uh, this uh, this uh, cube that you see here on the left, yeah, which is the full stack as I said here, the full stack vision yeah, of what a quantum, I don't dare to call it a quantum computer, but I call it a quantum accelerator because I've never even read a decent paper that described this is a quantum computer. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but um, and so many people make claims and actually many companies make claims too. But, but um, I will say something about that also later, later in my talk. So it is basically from qubits, the quantum bits, yeah, to a quantum accelerator, what is needed, what are the layers that we need to develop to, to make that happen. Uh, my personal background, I will not go into those details again, but I'm, I'm a computer engineer, so I worked a lot on acceleration. Uh, using FPGAs, I did that for many years, yeah? And for that, I also had to develop, let's say, a microarchitecture. I had to develop a, a, a programming language, yeah? And, uh, and, and you program in FPGA or VHDL or whatever language it is to create a hardware design using software. And so that is, that is my background. And you will, you will recognize many of the things as I'm explaining them, they, 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 they quite are, are quite common actually, yeah? Uh, and believe me one thing, yeah, I never went through a, an extremely more difficult period, an, an intellectually difficult period as when I, when I stepped into quantum, yeah? Uh, and I did that with, uh, with several young colleagues, um, uh, uh, Carmina Almudever and Nader Kamasi. And, and so with, with them, we really had to like say, what is quantum all about? So the first thing I did was Google quantum computing, you know, what, what quantum phenomena, and, and but I will explain some of those things later on. But it's, it's, it's uh, in, in, enormously challenging, yeah? and it's also the first time that I do believe that we have a new technology which has a substantial improvement over any classical hardware machine that we have built so far. Um, I start by immediately criticizing myself or everybody working in quantum computing. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and that is, uh, that is a, a statement by, by Rolf Landauer from, from IBM. And uh, he basically says, yeah, well, okay, there's so many uncertainties. Yeah, there's many noise and reliability manufacturing problems. Yeah, and probably it will not work. Yeah, so that is, that is something that, that, is, that was said by an IBM person. And IBM is a very strong player also in the quantum field. So, so but, but that, that shows also the, 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 the openness, the mind openness that people from IBM have. And very few companies have that actually, but IBM certainly has it. Yeah, to, to work on something, but also be critical towards itself. Yeah. In any case, I say personally, that is my, my personal opinion, yeah, that it takes 10, 20, maybe 30 years before we have any kind of meaningful result. Yeah. But I, I, do, I do say that we have to start now and that I hope to be, that it becomes clear uh, as, as I keep on talking. Now, 
there's always there's always a good a good way is to look in the past at, at history yeah and so when we look at let's say classical hardware classical computers that were that were built they were all based on transistors and uh, and i'm saying it is in 1934 that mr linienfeld the german yeah he formulated for the first time what a what what a single transistor could be and then it still took like maybe 20 years for, or 15 years or whatever but but it's multiple decades yeah before actually the, the three bardeen shockley and breton in bell Labs in the united states were were managed to actually create an, an operational version of the of, of several transistors but it still took and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm quoting here 2018 yeah every single device that we are using from our phones to our computers to our cars yeah it's loaded with with transistors so we we currently have 13 sextillion yeah uh, CMOS transistors so that's 10 to the power 36 and that is a number which is even too big yeah sextillion I can pronounce yeah but 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 simply imagine the the amount of of technology that is created to create all of the technology that we currently use on a daily basis from our washing machine our hair dryer to the car to to computers whatever it is so that is I think very important that we that we keep that in mind this is the background of classical hardware yeah and, uh, and, and then of course, at the same time, and now I'm talking again, the 20th century, yeah? And a lot of these things, actually a lot of these meetings, they happened, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Belgian, so I can make publicity for Belgium. They happened in Brussels because there was, uh, there was one big company that, that organized each year a big conference in which it invited physics uh, from all over the world. And here you see Einstein that you most likely recognize, but also Niels Bohr, the Danish, the Danish physics uh, person yeah and uh, and they they started uh, discussing with each other but uh, mostly against each other uh, 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 einstein he was really looking at the large phenomena yeah the, the planets and, and the moons or how planets with with the sun interact and how they move into one kind of universe and uh, and uh, niels bohr he was looking at, at atomic or subatomic level yeah and uh, and he said like well no okay it, it, it's true maybe this uh, this relativity theory of einstein yeah, but we're looking, I'm looking now at this, at this very small phenomenon like atoms or, or smaller than atoms. Yeah, and I don't see any kind of convergence of the, of the, the, the theory of Einstein at that level. Yeah, so that, that's, that is actually the starting point of a discussion which still is ongoing. Yeah, and, uh, and, and Feynman, I will, I will talk about him later, but he's basically who gave a talk and that's uh, around 1982, that he gave a talk that, uh, that if you really uh, if we really want to understand this quantum physics phenomena, but why not build a computer based on those principles? And that was not with the goal to be to make a new computer, but that was simply to, to have a tool that allows physics people to better understand what these quantum phenomena are all about. And I will come back to that also a bit later. Yeah. So uh, I know I, I asked Rui and, and Ishaka. So. so uh, I cannot assume that everything is known. Yeah, so I, I don't assume that everything is known, but I don't assume that nothing is known. So I give a, a very quick introduction to what quantum computing is all about. So, so what we know in classical hardware, yeah, so and that includes FPGAs, GPUs, classical processors, whatever it is, yeah, that's made out of bits, zeros or ones. It's an exclusive or. So it's either your bit is zero or it has the value one. And that is indeed an exclusive state. Yeah, uh, and in quantum, yeah, we do basically the same thing. Well, we have we have a different notation. Yeah, that's the right notation. That is that is a way for the physics people to dis to separate themselves. Yeah, but that, that's fine. It makes it makes a lot of sense actually to do it in this way. So you also have a zero a zero quantum bit and a one quantum bit, and then of course you have this vertical sign and the bigger down, but can be also, the vertical sign can be on the right, and then the, the smaller down, the bigger down sign can be on the left. So they, these are just notation things, yeah? You say, okay, but that's, that seems to be, oh, there is also an or, and then you say, yeah, hey, uh, Mr. Mr. Kuhn, what, what, why, why, what, what is the difference? Oh, there is a difference, because we can also simply combine the zero and the one in one particular state, and that is what we call the superposition. That is what I represent here, yeah, with the superposition, where where two bits, yeah, quantum bits, and that's why we call them Q bits. Yeah, quantum bit is called a Q bit from now on. Yeah, so whenever I mention quantum bit or qubit, yeah, this is this is the notation that I'm that I'm assuming. So when I put them in superposition, that means I have a new qubit psi, yeah, 
which same same notation, the square bread, the direct notation, yeah, that consisting of the, the zero and the one, the one component, but there's also something else. There is the alpha zero and the alpha one. And that, that, is, that seems to be, why is that? Well, that, these are parameters. These are what we call amplitudes. And I will come back to those amplitudes because they are extremely important. If we, if, we, if we get a result at some point from quantum calculation, it's usually the amplitude that we have to look at because the zeros and the ones yeah, is, is like the base state. It's either in the zero or the one or and the one state or it can be plus and minus. So we have two base states in, in principle that we use in quantum computing is zero, one or plus and minus. And always with the same kind of yeah, direct notation yeah, the, 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 the vertical line and the bigger downside, yeah, in plus, plus or minus. So these, these amplitudes, why are they important? Because these are the ones that undergo changes whenever we make a quantum operation, yeah? And I will say something about those quantum operations later on, yeah? But this basically means either if you increase the alpha zero and therefore you may decrease the, the amplitudes of other qubits, yeah? Uh, and and uh, or you, you decrease it and increase it. That is how how there is some kind of varying uh, uh, gain going on between between these amplitudes and between the qubits related to these amplitudes. And at the end of your your quantum computation, your quantum algorithm, yeah, you you need to do a measurement. And I will say something about that measurement too, because. Um, uh, and I will, I will come up with, with alternative plans, right? Uh, because if we're lo really looking at the quantum physics phenomena, yeah, in which I, I, I have these quantum bits of these qubits and I'm, and I'm manipulating these alphas, so these amplitudes, yeah, then, then, uh, then this, is, this is usually how one qubit looks like. Yeah? And, then, and then I can rewrite these amplitudes, yeah? rewrite it in this particular way and this one in this particular way. So it's square brackets, so that's absolute value. And then I square it. And of course, together, that means it's 100%. So I always get, get, a, get the quantum state, which is always going to be true. But I don't know how much is going to be based on the zero part, on this part, and how much is going to be based on this part. In order to know that, we need to measure them. Yeah? That is what we call here reading out the information or measuring them. So that's why I, I, I drew here an I. Yeah, and, and that, is, that is a specific thing in, quantum, in the quantum physics world. There is no way in which we can formally measure whatever the quantum state is without actually destroying the superposition in which we place them. Yeah? Because now I have one qubit, which, which has two layers, yeah? so the, the zero and the one. But when I do a readout, yeah, I basically destroy either the one or I destroy the zero. So I get with a particular kind of probability I can do measurement in which that gives me the zero result or the one result, yeah? And that's why, that's why at the end of any quantum computation, I get, I get an indication that this is either the result, yeah? Or, and that is an exclusive or, this is the result. And the fact that, uh, that we have to do these this, uh, this measurements in this particular way, yeah? That means we're, we're doing non-deterministic computing because if we, if we compute, if we execute, an algorithm that you've all already been programming your, your entire, well, many of your years uh, uh, in your professional life. Yeah, you run it once, that's good. You run it twice, but it gives you the same result. Yeah, there may be some minor, minor, minor differences in, in the rounding or whatever it is, but you basically get always the same kind of results. Yeah, when you run it in a quantum computing context, yeah, then, then you, may, you may end up, let's say, with, with X percent uh, let's let's say I'm gonna make it 20% cases. I will get this 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 uh, this result, and in 80% of the cases I will get the one result. That is so. That is what we call non-deterministic computing. That means that every uh, quantum software, and for for you people that's very important, needs to be run more than once, maybe five times, maybe ten times, maybe a hundred times. There is no general rule yet that actually allows you to say, I need to run it, but more than once, for sure, and more than twice too, yeah? because I can still have, let's say, 50%, 50%, even when this is the distribution of probability. Yeah? So that is important to, to, not, to, not to forget. Yeah? And everybody knows, of course, uh, Schrodinger's cat, yeah? that he puts a live a life cat in, into a box, and in that box there is some kind of radioactive uh, uh, thing, thing uh, li, uh, uh, um, hanging there, and then either um, a, a, a hammer kills the bottle or, or uh, breaks the bottle, 
yeah, killing death by the cat, or it does not break the, the bottle and therefore keeps, keeps the cat alive. And here again, I use the same kind of probability, 80, 20, I can do 70, 32, right? That is just like a, an illustration. Yeah, so I, when I'm repeating it, each time I have to do a measurement. So inside the box, I know there is a cat, but the only thing we don't know is whether the cat is alive or dead. So I need to open up the box, and by opening up the box, and I need to do that multiple times, yeah, then of course the, the bottle will be broken or never be broken, and therefore the cat will live or, or will be dead. That is kind of the image, yeah? This is not how, how it will work in, in reality, yeah? So why are we interested now in quantum computing? Yeah, and again, I will go again by making the comparison between quantum, co the classical computing, uh, ha classical hardware computing, so CMOS-based computing, and, and, and qubit-based uh, computing. And here you see again, I have my, my zero bit and my one bit, classical bit, yeah, and I can combine them in any particular way. And you see that they are separated by the exclusive or. So it's either 000 or 001 or, or, or 111. These are exclusive uh, separations, yeah? So I say, yeah, okay, I can, do, I can do the similar kind of thing. Yeah, I can also combine three qubits. So this is the, the one qubit that I spoke about in the previous slides. This is the one qubit psi, yeah? But why not combine three qubits? Yeah, psi one, psi zero, psi one, psi two, why not? That means I'm combining yeah, three qubits into this, this, uh, this direct state, yeah? So I have zero, 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 0, 0, 001 up to 111. This is these are the, the slides, the, the slides, sorry, the qubits uh, that I have. And each of those qubits have their particular kind of amplitude, A of alpha 0, 0, 0, alpha 0, 0, 001, yeah, until uh, the alpha 111. Yeah. And so what you see here is again the difference between quantum and CMOS-based computing is the AND operator. Yeah. So that means it's and in this zero zero state and in this one and in all of the others so i'm two to the power three yeah that's why i write here two to the power n i'm combining three qubits so that's two to the power three which gives me eight that's why i have eight different kinds of uh, quantum states yeah with eight different kind of amplitudes related to every every base state in in the the three qubit dimension that i'm that i'm looking at yeah and so this immediately gives you an, an enormous leverage because what is, what is specific about quantum computing, yeah, and I will criticize myself about that yeah, later on, yeah, but no, by, by proposing an alternative, yeah, uh, a, a short-term alternative. So when I do a quantum, let's say, implementation on, on, on qubits, yeah, on, on physical qubits, then, and I'm ex executing, let's say, uh, this, this particular equation, yeah, then I will go in all of these layers in parallel, automatically. I don't need to do anything. And for software people and even computer engineers, they say like, wow, this is incredible. I don't need to program anything in, in, a, in a parallel way because the parallelism is something you get for free from the quantum physics. Yeah? There are of course a lot of bits yeah, or things that don't really work. And I will, and I will come back to those uh, too, because we are absolutely not there yet. But the principle is, 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 is basically true that we can execute all of these things in parallel by one execution of, of this, this equation that we have. Yeah? And we don't need to parallelize anything. So let's compare it now a little bit to, to classical CMOS. Yeah? This is a graph that you can find on the internet. Yeah? Um, and I'm basically only interested, so this, this uh, uh, brown, uh, brown thing are the transistors. And that indeed follows Moore's law. So it doubles every, every 16 to, to two, two years. Yeah? It kind of doubles the number of transistors that we have. So that is kind of a straight line on an exponential curve here. Yeah? Let's not forget, this is an exponential curve. So it's 10 to the power one, two, three, four, 10 to the power. So it should, it should basically go, yeah? it should go something like this. Yeah? If, if you really were to draw it in a correct way. Yeah? But that's why we have these scales that, that makes things a bit easier. So this, the black thing is then what, what I wanna, wanna look at right now. And it took, let's say, until, let's say, 2007, yeah, before companies like, like IBM, but, but let's say also certainly like Intel, decided that they have to move, let's say, in multi-core kind of thing. Yeah? And multi-core for Intel was simply say, oh, I have one processor, oh, I'm gonna add a second one. And we make it into four and then into eight. And that is how, yeah, but they realized also that this never really scales up 
the, the, the compute performance. So that is basically what they tried to do here. And then they decided, oh, and it's not homogeneous multi-core, but it's heterogeneous multi-core. So uh, GPUs, TPUs, yeah, even now FPGAs, because in 2017, that's somewhere around here, they decided to buy uh, Altera, which is a US uh, Xilinx, uh, no, a US, uh, sorry, Xilinx, a US FPGA manufacturer. And they, they spent multiple billions uh, to, uh, to buy that company. So you see how important is diversity in the compute power is. And, and uh, so my vision, my personal vision is, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm starting this QB thing, yeah, is that we, we need to make quantum accelerators. Yeah? And that is what I will be talking about later. Now, this is again, another way of expressing the, the performance of, uh, yeah, and I, and, uh, this, I see this is kind of uh, 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 an error in my, in my slide, but okay. Uh, these are simply the four, the four um, uh, qubits yeah, that, that I have in the, in the low, at the lowest level, but, but that's fine. Yeah, you simply see there's a, a rapidly growing exponential curve here because this is also an exponential curve here. On, on, on this side, yeah, and uh, and here we can go. Let's assume that we can go up to 300 ideal qubits. So the things that really stay perfect, yeah, they do whatever it is that you want it to do. Then this this results in a number that I cannot even express myself. But I read somewhere uh, that this is a number bigger than the estimated number of atoms in the known universes. So not only in ours, and that means on all of the planets in our own universe but there are millions of universes. So that is kind of, that is how big the number is and that really shows what the potential compute power is of quantum, yeah? But, but especially, we are not there yet. Let, let's, let's be very clear. So where are we now uh, in terms of the, the oh, where, where are we now in terms of, let's say, the overall uh, community, all the scientific communities worldwide? And that is why it's an open invitation to everybody, everybody who is wanting to do research software, hardware, mathematics, yeah, uh, setting up your own company, that is your, your invited. So computer engineers, yeah, I put ourselves yeah, below, below these particular two dotted lines. Yeah, um, and, and of course, I do mention mathematics people because if, if you don't express it in, in, in correct mathematics, then you will never get, get a correct result. Yeah, and it's tensor mathematics. I, I may explain certain about things, but, but anyway, that would go too far. Yeah, but um, so I've been I've been seven years, uh, six, seven, you know, five, five years. I've been working with quantum physics people. Yeah, in this part. Yeah, and now we we can we can easily go do a microarchitecture for 150, 200 kind of real real qubits. So the, the actually the bad ones, like I will call them bad ones. Yeah, um, and that's basically. But there there nobody is there. Yeah, if you read about what Google is doing, and and and, and not to insult anybody here. Yeah, but they were maybe at, at 70, 80, sometimes they claim 100 and something. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, in Delft at least, uh, they're, they're at 17 qubits. Yeah, and the goal is to make one logical qubit, yeah, around 49 qubits. Again, I will not explain all these things, but that basically means we're, we're still nowhere. Yeah, so we're very far away from anything that is, that is useful by industry, by society or, or anything. Yeah, so that's why I recently made, made the move into, into this, this side. Yeah. So uh, it's 2020 now, uh, we're, we're somewhere here. Yeah, so this is, this is where, I, where, where I think I wanna be now as a scientist, yeah, and, uh, and still work on the mathematics, the full stack, yeah, with computer science people, with, with software people. That is what I, what I think we should be doing. And it takes another maybe five to 10 years to 20 years, I don't know, before we can start joining things again, once there's some kind of stability in the behavior of these quantum bits in these qubits, okay? That is just to give you the big picture of where we are. This is also a graph, and, and I, I, I explicitly will, will mention it. That is the one that, that, that was made by Gartner. Gartner is a, is a very famous IT consulting company in the US, and they make the hype curve, yeah, the hype cycle. And you see here yeah, in, in red, you see quantum computing, yeah, and you see all, all other kinds of technologies that are super, super, people are super enthusiastic about to put money into it and, and, yeah, until you reach a level and then you see, wow, it doesn't keep on growing. It keeps actually going down because now the complication really pops up and we have to solve all of these complex problems. So a lot of people step out of the, out of all of these fields. Yeah. And it's only very late that, that I think uh, uh, universities like where most of us belong to, yeah. Uh, 
we that's why we have to persist in, in keep on investing into that hardware and, and, and in the technology such that we will pick it up yeah and, and start realizing real real uh, useful applications so that's why uh, this is a this is a graph and you can find quantum computing that it starts somewhere here and you see it growing up and, and, and rising and rising so we're, we're basically maybe two three four years away from from the top reaching the top yeah and then there's a steep decline and that is uh, that you have to be very careful about that that you're not discouraged by that decline yeah because there's still a, a, a incredible kind of opportunity now i already mentioned that the transistor people from from the CMOS world yeah, and here I'm simply showing yeah, six examples, and I will not go into, into any of them. Yeah, six, six examples of what is currently used to make qubits. Yeah, trapped ions, graphene, majoranas, NV centers, so diamonds. Yeah, and then some so ion traps, uh, uh, semi superconducting qubits, and and there are even more. Yeah, but 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 that basically means like we're in the pre-transistor phase, so we don't really even know how to make one good qubit leave alone thousand qubits, millions, billions qubits. We, we don't even know that, yeah? So, so that is where, where we are right now, yeah? Here you see all the companies that were created, yeah? And, and you, you, most, you know most of them, of course, yeah? Um, so Intel is in CMA in super, uh, BM in super. Most of them are actually in superconducting qubits, yeah? But 10 years ago, everyone, everybody was in ion traps, yeah? And maybe in 10 years from now, everybody will, I don't know, in graphene or in something else, yeah, I, I don't know what how it will evolve, but it's not. It's it, nobody. Nobody's really. No technology is really dominating. Yeah, so that I think is important. Eh? My Oranos, graphene energy center. So, so you see, that is how it will still that 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 fight is still going on and will keep on going. So now I come a bit closer to to what, what you're hopefully uh, still interested in. Are that what applications are, can we do with that? Yeah, and uh, and I will not go through all of them. Yeah, I will simply mention that. D-Wave, the, the famous Canadian company, yeah, is uh, do, doing with uh, optimizations. Yeah, they claim to already have thousands of gates or qubits, yeah, but nobody really knows what these qubits are. Nobody, yeah, and it's like big one, big secret, yeah. Even though uh, companies like uh, uh, no or organizations like NSA, they buy these these uh, D-Wave machines for 10, 20, 30 million dollars, yeah, just to use them. Nobody really knows what's going on, but that's fine. Yeah, that that, that seems to be the hype cycle of uh, of Gartner. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot in chemistry that 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 is that is going on. Yeah, and uh, and I will say something at some point uh, later today about the uh, DNA, uh, but I will simply say something about also encryption. Yeah, because we do have uh, that that uh, usually the, from the U.S. when science science was was funded, it was through the DARPA Defense Agency Research Program. Yeah, but now it's IARPA, the intelligent agencies. They're the ones that are putting a lot of money into, into quantum logic and in quantum hardware. Yeah, because they want to they wanna understand, of course, all of the demos, the, 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 the bad uh, terrorists. Yeah, and it's quotation mark, right? I, 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 don't, I don't believe what, whatever it is, but that's the vision behind why a lot of the money comes from the IARPA kind of community. Yeah, and, and I will talk more about, about uh, the, the diagnosis later on. Are we there? Well, I think I already made, made a clear message. No, we're not there. Yeah, we still have maybe 10, 20, 30 years to go before we reach any kind of meaningful uh, application and, and reliable computation that we can do with, uh, with quantum devices. So what are all of the challenges? And I listed a lot of them, yeah? So I'm not gonna be boring you uh, because you will have the slides, yeah? But it's basically the quality is extremely important, yeah? So they, they go here. So I put the qubit in a particular state and then, then I'm talking about nanoseconds, and a nanosecond is like one billionth of, of, of a second. So it goes bam into the ground state. Yeah, uh, we have we have uh, wrong wrong gate computations. Yeah, these are these are single qubit gates. These are rotation, some kind of football. Yeah, in three dimensions, and either you overshoot or you undershoot. But it's very difficult to get to get an exact uh, computation. Yeah, which is a rotation in this block sphere for a single qubit gate. Yeah, and uh, and and on top of that. We only have very small number of, of qubits, real qubits, physical qubits. Yeah? Uh, on top of that, yeah, this is uh, maybe I, I do want to highlight again, yeah, is that the error rates. So in CMOS, we are used to dealing with 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16, minus 15, minus 16. 
Yeah? Whereas in quantum computing, we have errors every 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 operations. So there's huge difference in reliability and the, 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 the quality of, of, the, of the computation between how we classically build uh, machines and how quantum allows us to do it. Yeah? Um, of course, there's analog versus digital. Yeah? I, will, I will not, not talk about that right now. Yeah? But quantum applications, yeah? there, there are hardly any kind of quantum applications that are, that are currently being developed. So that is again an open invitation to the software com compute, uh, uh, com commuting, um, yeah, so software uh, people, yeah, to start looking at various kinds of applications and start developing languages and, and algorithms for that. Yeah, oops. Um, so um, anyway, I will say something towards the end about the test and execution platform. So I will not, I will not spend time on it right now. So what do I think, nevertheless, is in spite of all of the problems and all of the potential goodness that we have in quantum, yeah, we have to make a complete mind shift. Yeah? Whereas we have, the, let's say, the physical qubits, which, which decohere and go do wrong things in, in the quantum computations, yeah? why I simply throw away those kinds of real qubits, and we call it perfect qubits. If I put it there, in two hours from now, or in two seconds, or in 50 days from now, it's still going to be in that particular state. So no decoherence, no error rates. Do you think, yeah, okay, you make our life now too easy. Trust me, it is not easy at all, yeah? Because in order to make a good algorithm, you have to test it, yeah? And, and, uh, and that takes multiple years, yeah? And I will give the example later on about our DNA kind of analysis that we're currently, uh, that we're currently working on. So I want to say something about these quantum accelerators, yeah? How are modern computers being built today? Well, that is, there's a classical processor, yeah? The CPU here, yeah? And then we connect FPGA, yeah, we can have GPUs, TPUs, uh, that is uh, the Google kind of thing. Why shouldn't we connect also a quantum accelerator to it? Yeah, to the CPU that, 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 that gets data from a main memory or from, from other sources. And here, uh, I again, I repeat the error rates that we, that we used to have in, in, in conventional kind of technology, 10 to the minus 15, minus 16. And what we have in, in quantum computing, 10 to the minus 2. And if you, if you then simply say, no, we're going to be using perfect qubits. Then you throw away the 10 to the minus 2. It can be as good as 10 to the minus 15. You said, oh, that's fine. We don't have to worry about it. Yeah? So that, I think, is an important message yeah, that, 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 that I want to bring today. Yeah? Uh, these are just the same two qubits. Yeah? This is what we did in the past four, five, uh, six years yeah? with, the, with, the, with the physics uh, people. Yeah? So semiconducting supercomputer, I will not re repeat that. Yeah, and this is what I want to be doing now, uh, working on with the, with perfect qubits and still doing exactly the same. And maybe you can even read out the the, the potential quantum applications, quantum sensors, uh, quantum space, quantum autonomous driving, quantum AI, uh, and also quantum genome sequencing, which is what I will talk about uh, uh, later on. Why am I showing this this particular thing? Because I went. That was last year in September. Yeah. Uh, because I, I was trying to get an, yet another, for the fourth time, I think, for uh, yet another project submitted to the, to the quantum flagship, you know, that is this, this huge quantum, uh, no, this, this flagship kind of initiatives that, that EU, the Europe uh, takes, yeah, in, in, in the human brain and, and uh, graphene. And now the third one, I think, is in quantum. Yeah, and, and I spoke with, uh, with the, actually the EU responsible of the, of the quantum flagship. And, uh, and you know what he said? Yeah, that uh, that even the ten to the minus two, yeah, is exaggerated because they, if the physics people are honest, yeah, then they would they would admit that even the ten to the minus two, ten to the minus three, it's very difficult for them to achieve that. Yeah, and that simply shows, like, and and that does not. There's one bad thing that does not mean I get more money. Yeah, no, absolutely not. But this simply means that 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 the the, the realization is really popping up that people specialize and responsible for the flag, the quantum flagship, they realize like, oh my God, we're nowhere. Yeah, so keep that in mind. I will come back to that. Uh, and I give one example because yeah, otherwise everybody gets demotivated. So I have to motivate people to show something. Yeah, well, the compute power is still incredible. So let's simply assume that, that we have a, a, a 2000 bit number, yeah, that we need to factor. So what are the factor components that when multiplied give us a 2048 bit number, yeah? And, um, and let's, assume, let's assume that Germany and the Netherlands are no longer countries, 
but they're they're completely united. They're one big uh, data center, so around four hundred thousand square kilometers, just one big computer center. Yeah, no single house, not a street, nothing. Yeah, and we're talking here about many people that are, that live there. Yeah, and let's assume we have this Chinese supercomputer, or it can be whatever it is. Yeah, that that is filled this uh, four hundred thousand square kilometers. How long would it take to to compute classically? Yeah, with that supercomputer, the 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 factors of this two thousand forty eight, it would take about a hundred years, an incredibly big budget in trillions. Yeah, so that is a thousand times a billion. Yeah. And it would basically consume all the energy of the earth in one month. So, so I basically say like, okay, you, you can never do that classically. Yeah. And that is why the intelligent agencies of the United States are so enthusiastic about, about quantum because yes, with quantum, maybe we can do it because if we do a quantum computer, yeah, you immediately see how many billion of qubits that we need. This is a huge amount. Yeah. And there, we can use Shor's uh, factoring uh, algorithm. Shor is a professor now at MIT. And that would take about an hour, uh, about a day. So he said, like, okay, that is why we really need to have a quantum computer because, oh, it's gonna break, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna break all of the codes so that no, no terrorist, whatever it is, yeah, or, or bad person can do something against the United States or, or against whomever it is. But simply that shows again, how, how big the, the compute power potentially is of quantum, yeah? And now where are we? Well, we are still very far away because we need to make all of these layers, yeah? And so I, I show here the five layers that we, that we still have to make. Basically, this is one that we have, yeah, that we made ourselves. Actually, we have implementations of all these layers, yeah? Let's be very clear, yeah? That, that I also want to share at some point yeah, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with anybody who is interested in making that move. Yeah, because you don't need to make your own language. Yeah, because we have our own programming language. And I will say something about that later. We have a microarchitecture for sure. Yeah, yeah based on, on qubits that, that, that are perfect qubits. And we can execute that on our own simulator so that we can get results too. And by the way, these are exact results. I will come back to that later. So. If you're in software, you know you're using you're using so, uh, compilers, the language programming language compilers, and uh, and so you have either the host compilers it can be Intel or an IBM or an ARM, yeah, which used to be European but now it's, it's Japanese I think, yeah. Oops, um, oh wait, now we go, yeah. So this is this is the the host compiler because any application always consists of let's say classical logic that needs to be run on a classical processor and will have quantum logic. And the quantum logic, let's be very clear, is always a combination of classical logic, so if then else the for and the while loops, plus quantum gates, yeah? And then you can, you can still, still separate them in virtual, yeah, in logical and physical. And physical, we've been doing that. We, we, we made all of the tools the physics people need, yeah? So now um, we're mostly looking here at the virtual level, yeah? And so we're basically here now, yeah, and the quantum physics people are there. So you can imagine there's a huge difference between, between those different layers and between those communities too, yeah? And again, I will not explain all of, all of these, uh, these, these aspects, but basically we go, we go up to there, yeah? Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and we, we were up to, up to that point for the physics people, yeah? We worked on fault tolerance too and things like that. Yeah, but now we, we I don't, because I don't want to be doing that. Yeah, let them first solve the, the physics problem. And then we can think about, about making logical qubits and whatever it is. Yeah. So this, this simply sketches the big picture of what a, a quantum compiler looks like. And, uh, and we base it on, we call it OpenQL, which is based on OpenCL. Yeah. And that produces, uh, let's say, a, qu a quantum assembly, the sequasm here. Yeah, that at some point can be translated into an executable. That's why the E pops up. Yeah, there's an E here, executable. Because we, we worked on microarchitecture for superconducting qubits that we had like, we have up to 17 now, yeah? Or semiconducting, and we have one. Yeah, that's for Intel, one semiconducting. So that's something to say, okay, sure, we can go up to 100 and 250, that, that's fine. We can all support that. That is not that is not a challenge anymore. So, so we say, okay, this this for us is not where where we uh, as computer engineers, computer scientists need to be need to be active. Yeah. So this is where this is where we are now focusing on uh, in in our in our in our future 
couple of years. Yeah? Again, uh, to simply give you an overview of the language, yeah, it, it is based on OpenCL, which we may use from, from, from this uh, GPU kind of uh, programming language. Yeah, as all the classical uh, object uh, object oriented Ethan Nelson while in for loops. Yeah, uh, we're also using a database to store our data in so that we can analyze and visualize the data. Yeah, we have also make we're making a library of quantum of quantum gates. Yeah, uh, and we, we're talking here also about quantum object because this is programming, right? This is a, a, an object oriented language, OpenQL. So, of course, we need to be able to represent qubits, we need to represent amplitudes. We need to be able to represent and model the quantum gates, single or two or two or more qubit gates. Yeah, and we need to be able to do measurements. Yeah, these are all the things that we need whenever we do some something in software yeah, quantum wise. Yeah, and, uh, and and of course we need to generate our OpenQL compiler generates all of the all of this, the 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 sequasm, yeah, which is the which which will run in the microarchitecture. And that we can also send to our our uh, our uh, simulator, our quantum simulator. Yeah, that is that is basically what uh, what OpenQL is all about. So, uh, again, what the physics people is doing are doing is is below here. Yeah, and what we are now doing is actually below below the line here. So that's why I emphasize here we're working on perfect qubits. Yeah, industry, society, and anybody who is interested in that can 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 actually start thinking about about those those aspects. So let me give you one one particular example, yeah, uh, about genome sequencing, yeah, and uh, and maybe you 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 may have known that, or maybe you have children that are doing uh, uh, medic medicine uh, uh, as a studies, but they will get everything now based on on the genome, on your genetic profile, and anything from now until let's say the next decades will be based everything in medicine will be based on our or your or mine a gene genetic profile. And so there is, there is a process yeah, that we call this genome sequencing, which is basically looking, looking at, at the whatever you have and then put that into a particular sequence. Yeah? And I will come back to that in, in, in a second. Let me first introduce some of the notions that you need to, to know uh, before you really understand what, what this genomic computing is all about. And I will not go into the, the details of the algorithm. Yeah? I, had the, uh, I had the master's student who's now doing his PhD with me, yeah? Aritra, and, and he made the, the genome sequencing in the quantum way. Yeah? And I was looking at genome analysis. Yeah? So whatever it is, uh, you, need, you need to know something about DNA and RNA. I will not even uh, uh, pronounce what, what these things mean. But DNA basically means it's your overall long-term genetic profile. And the RNA is actually something that you can make out of, well, actually the source of DNA is the RNA, yeah? And so the RNA is now made to make proteins. And these proteins, these are, these are components in your body that will, that will maybe become your lungs or that may become certain kinds of, of, of your body, bodily uh, function. Yeah, but that is that is why why we, we we need to know something about DNA and RNA. Yeah, uh, whatever we do in genome sequencing is basically the DNA, but it can also be done on RNA. Yeah, so there's a, there's something like the genotype and the phenotype. The genotype is the the entire set of genes you you or, or we all are carrying. Yes, your overall profile, and the phenotype are the observable things: the color of your eyes, how big you are, how how slim or how fat you are yeah uh, these these kind of things though this is called the phenotype and this i already explained so the quantum bits yeah the the alpha and the beta yeah, for the two base states yeah and the 100 percent. i think this is simply repeating such that yeah I'm, I'm refreshing your mind hopefully a little bit yeah and then we can still need to oh, that we need to combine uh, one qubit or, or multiple qubits together yeah and this is a this is a three this is this uh, block sphere yeah, for a single qubit byte, this is a rotation in, in, the, in the football, basically. Yeah? And I will, I will not come back to that unless it's really, really important. Um, but I do want to emphasize, yeah, and um, I, I promise Rui that I'll be very short on this, yeah, but why, why uh, do I think is, is, um, is uh, genomics uh, extremely important? Because we, we, the entire world came out of something kind of the, the, the COVID or the corona kind of uh, uh, pandemic. Yeah? And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm simply saying that, that this is the, the pandemic yeah, is, is still kind of relatively modest yeah, because we're around half a million yeah, on a population of around 7.5 billion people. Yeah? And, I'm, and I exaggerate here with the numbers and of course the, 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 
the, the, the rectangle is not big enough, but I'm, I'm exaggerating. So I say, okay, times four, yeah? Still, this is the population, yeah? And uh, uh, so, so then, then we have this kind of percentage of people dying, so 0.026%, yeah? Now, if you compare it to something that happened 100 years ago, 1919, well, that was called the Spanish flu, and there, there 50, 50 million people died, on a population, I make it 2 billion, but actually it's 1.5 billion, yeah? But I wanna make sure that nobody can blame me that I'm losing the wrong number. So I, I exaggerate the, the, the numbers in a direction which are not pro me, yeah? But then you have around two, two and a half percent of the people worldwide dying. And we did not have in 1919, the fully connectedness of people flying from, from China to the US and over Europe and, and the entire world around, yeah? That, was, that went through both or whatever it is, so we didn't have, but still the death rate is 50 million people out of 1.5, and now we only have like 500,000, okay, make it 2 million, yeah, out of 7.5 billion people. So simply to show that, that where we are is somewhere in this red, red square, yeah? We don't know whether we're gonna be here or whether we're gonna be there. The Spanish flu is clearly here, yeah, with the 50 million people, yeah? Uh, and where, where are we gonna be? We don't know. So this is rapid spreading and going that direction. This, this is uh, rapid, rapid spreading shows here. Yeah, and this is more deadly. So the higher you are, the deadlier you are. So that's why Spanish flu is pretty high, but we still have bird flu, Ebola. Nobody seems to talk about Ebola. Yeah, yeah. We had SARS a couple of years ago, also very deadly. Nobody talks about these things anymore. So why is it suddenly that Corona, COVID, yeah, is now the, the big problem. Again, it's not that I don't believe it's a problem, but why, why I think it is important that we need international collaboration, much more than we have right now, to work together for a global vaccine for any kind of future very deadly virus that we will encounter as human beings, okay? Okay, let me go now into, let's say, the, the logic a little bit, yeah? And I will, and I will uh, skip a couple of slides, and I will not go into these things too, too much, yeah? But this is our, our C-quasm, yeah, that we, that we developed, eh? this, this common quasm assembly, yeah, and C means the common part, yeah, because executable, it's either you go to, to, a, graph, to, a, to a graphene qubit or superconducting, semiconducting, the E changes a certain number of things, yeah, so C means it's common, yeah, so we abstract away, it goes to our simulator, that's good enough, yeah, and so you see here, uh, we see, for instance, I will go, this is a Halamar, this is an X gate, Toffoli gate, yeah, I will not go through all of these gates at because uh, it's not like this this kind of introduction that I want to give. Yeah, but it simply says we have we superpose the, the data, then we create the distance between uh, the the reference genome and what the, what the short read is because I will talk about that in in a second too. Yeah, and then we we need to show what is the lowest uh, or zero Hamming distance that we have for such a, such, such a short read. Yeah. And I want to emphasize we're looking here only at genome sequencing. Now, why, why do we need to, to, to compute this Hamming distance? Yeah, because we have a reference genome. The, the, human, the human genome is 3.2 billion characters long, yeah, and only uh, consisting out of, uh, out of uh, uh, wait, then I have to see now, uh, do I have, a, uh, out of these four components, yeah, yeah, so, so that basically means. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, this cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine, yeah? These are only the four components that make any kind of DNA structure, any kind, yeah? So that is, that is very important to, to realize, yeah? And for the human beings, we're at 3.2 billion, yeah? So wait, and I'm, I'm gonna go back here uh, for, for a second. So what we need to do is see we have short reads. So I spoke about Illumina, this company, yeah? 90% of all DNA, generated in the world comes out of Illumina machines. So it's that big. This is a multi-billion company, yeah? And so, so this is an extremely important player in, in that field. So what, why, why don't they have, let's say, 3.2 readings of, of the DNA? Because there is no machine that can actually do that, that much reading. So they have short reads, yeah? And that goes like 50 characters long, up to maybe 250, maybe 500. And, and, and the more, the longer it is, the better you, you can map it, but, but uh, the, the, and also the fewer components you can have. Right? If 3.2 billion you divide by, by 50 or by 500, that's immediately a, a factor 10 difference. So that means the less components you need to rank and, and put in a particular sequence. Yeah? And I will come back to that uh, later. Yeah? Uh, 
Uh, I will not go into the, the details because you're software people, yeah? but you know that everything in software runs on hardware. Yeah? And I'm a computer engineer, so I make hardware. Yeah? And so whenever we have our QX simulator is this part, the QX simulator. Oh, and I have multiple of ones, yeah, and I will explain that also a bit, a bit later, yeah. And then I have uh, instruction, yeah. I have DNA, uh, uh, the the, the uh, readouts from from let's say these Illumina machines, yeah. I'm not making publicity for Illumina, but a DNA machine, yeah. And then we have I have logic, and I have uh, classical instructions that will go into the blue part, which is the quantum accelerator part, and then there are other parts that will still go to the classical processor. Yeah, so I'm only talking here uh, about, about the blue part, and I will not go into, into too many details here, yeah, but you can recognize that there's uh, quantum instructions needs to be uh, uh, translated into qubits, into where are these qubits residing into my, per, my, my local and partial symbol table, qubit symbol table. This is classical memory, yeah? And then I can I, I have some execution of, of instructions that I will send to, let's say, ultimately to, to QX, to any of those QX, and then I can measure, measure out and, and read back the results, get that into the partial quantum state, and update my qubit symbol table. That's basically how you keep on going. At some point, you, you reach a final state, and that's, that's basically it. Again, these are, these are the, the components I already spoke about. Oh, I'm repeating here slides, so, so I'm, I will not go through that. This is, uh, this is, for instance, an example. This is uh, just an example, right, of 32 uh, reference genome, yeah? Uh, so the CRTGs, but, but we just have, let's say, green, yellow, red, and blue. These are the four colors, so they, they could represent those four components. And this is a short read. So this is now 50, 50 base pairs, yeah? So, but that means here we have five base pairs, yeah? And these five, we need to find where, where they fit into this, uh, this jet reference genome. So you have something that, that goes through the entire sequence, and only when, when you, you, you hit the lowest Hamming distance, yeah, that means there's one position difference in this sequence and my reference genome, it's, it's, on, it's, it's here. Yeah? So that's why it, it's one. That's where, where you should need, need, to, need to fill in the short read. And that you need to do for all of the short reads that, that the DNA machine is giving you, such that you end up with a fully uh, sequenced uh, uh, short reads into the reference genome. And then people like molecular biologists or medical people, they can look at that, that, that particular mapping yeah, to, to identify where potential sicknesses are uh, with, with people. That is basically what, uh, what we're doing. Yeah? And, uh, and this, this equation, don't worry about that because we're not going into the quantum uh, right now. Yeah? But let's, let's again go, let's look at, at the, the logic. Yeah? And this is just an illustration that, uh, that Aritra made. Yeah? that I have a very short uh, uh, reference genome of length four, yeah, only four, and I have a short read of length two. So that is kind of pretty, pretty simple, yeah? And so uh, two, uh, red and, and, and green, oh, and I have red and green, green, red. So we should try to find now where, where that actually matches. Now, we already immediately see, we visually see that this is the, the final result on position zero, zero, but how does that graph grammatically uh, and, uh, and algorithmically work, yeah? So there's several steps, yeah? I will, I will quickly walk over them, yeah? So we have to split this reference genome, yeah? So this is a database. We have to put that into, indeed, uh, some kind of database with, with different records, yeah? We have to index them. So this is one record, second record, third record. So that becomes one, one combination with an index. Zero, one is this combination, zero, uh, one, zero, yeah? And we see that the, the zero, zero is not there. But, but ultimately, yeah, it should be there. Yeah? So, and then we need to superpose, yeah? because oh, and now, now the quantum logic arrives, because this is everything here is classical. What we do is classical. Yeah? Uh, up till here is, is very classical kind of logic. So here we have some quantum logic popping in. So why not a superposition? That we start combining uh, all these, these qubits together with each other, yeah? uh, such that we, we, we can create uh, or compute the Hamming distance, yeah, as, I, as I said be, uh, in the slide before. So that simply means that we need to have, yeah, um, that, that I have my, my quantum uh, genome database. This is my short uh, read of my, my, my genomes. And this is again a database, yeah, but the colors is different. Yeah? You see here, this, because this represents the, the Hamming distance. Here I have the DNA, well, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, yeah? And these are, this, they, they may seem the same, 
but no, they're they're colored differently, yeah, and and because they represent the yellow. Yellow means it has the same the same hamming or or zero hamming distance. So a good a good hamming uh, so a very perfect fit of the 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 short read with the, with this particular uh, reference genome, yeah. And and then here you see that uh, that it that it will differ, yeah. When it's when it's fully uh, yellow here, that means it's a perfect fit, yeah. Because if I, that means with the zero is con is connecting to this uh, to this zero and this one is connecting to this one, so that's why the hamming distance here is zero and the hamming distance there is also zero. So that is a perfect fit. And then I do yeah, but I have to go through the entire database. So it's this zero with this one. Yeah, and this one with this one. Oh, with this one, that's good. That's having distance zero, so that is a perfect fit. But here I still have a difference one, so that is that is wrong. Yeah, and then I have to do with with all of the other entries in my genome database, my reference genome database. So that's why here I have two differences, and here I have one difference, which is this zero. Yeah, with this zero, and this one is different. That's why yeah, there is no yellow here, but it's it's a one. Yeah. And this is how, how the genome sequencing uh, works in, in the quantum way, yeah? such that we ultimately we know that this particular readout should be mapped onto location 00. zero. That is basically what we, what we have to do yeah? for all of the mil what billions of these short reads yeah? that we get from a DNA machine. Yeah? So that is why it's computationally extremely expensive yeah? to, to do. Uh, so these are the different steps that, that I that I just described to find a lo uh, find a location. Yeah, step zero and step one are kind of uh, step zero at least is, is classical. Yeah, and step one is also kind of classic. It's only here that we start uh, in superposing the the, the 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 qubits. Yeah, and then then all of the quantum gate operations are 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 executed on on that data. So that is basically what we do. And so whatever QB wants to be doing uh, in, in, the, in the future, partly looking only at the genomics part because there are other applications, but genomics yeah, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, shown within this dotted line, yeah, inside this dotted line. Yeah? So again, I will not go into the details of this thing yeah, because this is how the Hamming distance is computed. Yeah, and and uh, I will not go into the details because I already see that Rui is getting a bit worried that I'm taking too much time. So I will skip a couple of those slides. This is just a way to visualize. Yeah, and don't don't look at this for now. Yeah, but this is a way in which the quantum logic is visualized. Yeah, and so every line is is represents one qubit, and every operation yeah on such a line is a quantum gate that you apply on Q4, Q3, QT, Q1, or Q0. So here I have like five qubits, yeah, and I can go, let's say, up to uh, up to four Hadamars uh, or four X gates or or do Toffoli gates, whatever it is, or multiple qubits together, and that is how how a quantum algorithm looks like. So whatever you're doing, you also need to be able to visualize that in a particular way, yeah, and to realize the the, the logic of your of your quantum of your quantum algorithm in this particular way, yeah. So. Uh, and you, you give me a sign, but I'm, um, I think I'm close to the end. Eh? But but uh, uh, this is a way then how these amplitudes, because this represents the amplitudes, yeah, the amplitudes. So this is like very small amplitude. These are negative amplitudes, and this is one positive amplitude, yeah. And and if you if you translate all of these things now into a probability, yeah, then you get these values. Yeah. And then you see that this, this, uh, this amplitude, this large amplitude, becomes the largest probability. And these negative amplitudes here, yeah, they become also positive probabilities, but smaller ones. Yeah? And these are small amplitudes, and they get even, even smaller yeah, in, the, in the probability way of, of, of computing. So everything is done at this amplitude level, and that is a substantial speed up of, uh, of, uh, of computing yeah, and I will not go into these things. As, and I'm I'm close to my end. Yeah, I'm close to my end. Yeah, how how do we want to do this now? Uh, let's say in QB or or uh, in a university, is that that I we don't have any number of quantum physical qubits that are good enough to run to run these these algorithms on. So why don't we use supercomputers? And I simply sketch here five supercomputers. Yeah, and 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 I think in in. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there are several hundreds of supercomputers, yeah, several thousands all over the world. 
Yeah, and uh, so so that means we can connect them, yeah, through the internet or or in a particular way. And there's of course always some local so local memory and number of processors in a supercomputer that can go up to several tens of thousands of processors, yeah, with zettabytes of memory, yeah, so huge huge amounts of, of memory that we have available. And this is the run that I'm that I'm currently doing with the with the with the with the the, 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 the team that I'm building up again. Yeah, is how much how much we can do on one powerful machine yeah of let's say genome sequencing or other kinds of quantum algorithms that people have developed or that are available online yeah so that is i think nevertheless important that this is an important new way yeah if you program in perfect qubits that imposes still you can still need to do all the quantum gates yeah in the in the mathematics way that's tensor mathematics i will not explain that now yeah but but this is a way in which you can run those kinds of algorithms such that yeah, you can you can you can have and I will go, come to this slide now and and uh, and and trust me I'm almost at the end yeah um, so what what you need to do now if you run it on a supercomputer you need to parallelize your code and this is just a very oh, a very classical way of of showing that this is this is one path yeah and then and this is another path yeah and it gives completely different result and this is yet yet another path. Yeah, so so this is how you need to, to make make quantum algorithm uh, a parallel al an algorithm parallel. Yeah, uh, that is that is already a challenge in itself. Yeah, because we don't really know how to do that at a really large number of Q, uh, sorry of processors. Yeah, so but that is that is what we have to do right now. That is what we're currently doing with uh, with uh, with one master student and with uh, with Aritra. Yeah, and and if you do it, let's say in a superposition way, in a quantum way. This is this parallelism that you see here in the middle is something that you get in theory for free from the quantum physics, yeah? Because the parallelism, you don't need to worry about this thing. That will go automatically, yeah? And all the amplitudes, you don't have to, you, you don't have to do any computation for that. That will do, that the quantum physics people are doing, but we're absolutely not there. So if you wanna still do quantum logic and quantum software, yeah? You have to really invest into parallelization and run it, run it uh, in uh, graphically yeah, this way. You need to run it on a supercomputer. That is that is the, the the core message of what what we're doing. So that basically means that whatever I'm currently doing is simply in this green box, yeah. And and everything else is what the physics people are doing, and that's fine, yeah. We did a lot of things here. We did a lot of things, uh, uh, fault tolerance uh, simulation and implementation, and now this this uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum, yeah. I don't even want to go there. Let the physics people also solve some problems, right? So this is where, where, where we are right now. So um, there are metrics, yeah? There's a database that we're currently making. Uh, this is what it will contain, yeah, in a particular way. I don't have time to go into the, the details right now, yeah? But this is nevertheless, these are all the features that we need to look at, or, or you software people need to look at in order to understand how the quantum software looks like yeah, what kind of microarchitecture we would need? That's what I'm I'm looking at too. Yeah, how to expand our language? What the microarchitecture is? Our quantum simulator, etc. How can it execute all 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 these things? So, in conclusion, yeah, that's really my last ten seconds. Yeah, we we can we still have to wait five to ten, maybe longer years to have a, a quantum operational kind of uh, release. Yeah, uh, and and so, but we still have to think about all of the uh, all of the problems. The applications that we want to be running on those quantum devices and that takes five ten maybe also 20 years absolutely yeah and i simply want to highlight that i'm currently writing oh on request oh yeah uh, yeah oh sorry i have to yeah uh, i'm currently writing a request a request by acm you know acm maybe 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 not there eh? but but acm asked me to write a paper on quantum computing 40 50 pages and i'm almost halfway yeah uh, but it's going to be it's going to be released most likely in september yeah such that uh, this is a community the, the paper that will describe all of the layers and and what i make uh, what i want to make available for for colleagues like like you yeah that are interested in stepping into quantum into quantum software okay thank you very much for your attention Okay, thank you, Kun. Um, so uh, now we move to Q&A. Um, are there any questions to Kun? So you can either, you know, uh, just speak up or write your questions either in Slack or here in Zoom. Um, 
Uh, I do actually have one about the simulator. How many qubits can you simulate? Uh, we 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 can we can go let's say uh, on on a normal computer so that means a standalone machine we can go to thirty fully entangled qubits fully entangled qubits mm -hmm. yeah uh, we we do hope this is the test that we're going to be doing the next two months uh, we want to see how much memory we need to go for let's say hundred or hundred and fifty kind of qubits perfect qubits fully entangled that mm -hmm. is the maximum amount of memory that we will need so. Uh, I, I expect that we can go to 100, 150, which is already big enough for many, many, many problems. Eh? Because the, the the amount of data you you can you can store in that is is zettabytes big, even even bigger than zettabytes. Yeah. So so we can we 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 know small scale you can go up to 35, 40 maybe. Yeah. But for really big ones, you need you need too much much more memory. Right. And what, what is the paradigm? I mean, I, I know it's based on OpenCL, but uh, if you take a look at, like, say, Quizkit, uh, it's like circuits. Is it also circuits? Is it any other, any other paradigm to, to describe the quantum program? Yeah. So the Quizkit is the IBM thing. Uh, what, I, what I like about IBM is that they make things also available. Yeah, uh, of course, you, you can only run it, uh, let's say, well, you can run it on, a, on their simulator, but their simulator always has a particular kind of topology, yeah? A very strict kind of topology of how many qubits and how they are related with each other. In principle, we say, yeah, uh, we can also impose many restrictions because that makes our life easier, but your life much more difficult. Yeah, so we can we say we don't care about the topology. If you want to, if you want these two qubits to interact with each other, yeah, sure, that's possible. They don't need to be placed together. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you say no, I want to have that 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 or the, the 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 location nailed close to each other. Routing and mapping becomes needed. Yeah, so that is that is part of our scope that we that we need to make. Yeah, so you can you can in principle do do any kind of uh, random combination of qubits. Yeah, but you can still impose certain things of routing and 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 proximity. Yeah, such that uh, the move to let's say any kind of quantum device at some point. Yeah, is is relatively easy to do. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any, any questions to Kun at this point? I don't think so. Okay, uh, once again, thank you, Kun, for the interesting keynote. Okay. Now, um,